other issues. All right, guys. Hello. All right. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about some font stuff and uh, some business stuff. Um, basically, um, it's a couple of quotes of what I mentioned at the beginning. One is, nothing would please me more than being able to hire 10 programmers and deluge the hobby market with good software, which was Bill Gates writing in 1976. And another quote, creativity can be a social contribution insofar as society is free to use the result, which is Richard Stallman in 1985. So I'm Dave Crossland, and I'm currently studying on the Masters in Typeface Design program at the University of Reading, which is a one-year full-time course in typeface design. And uh, it's, it's pretty much like one of the only courses in the world. There's just a few others. Uh, it's quite a rare subject to study, uh, especially at that level. Um, and the reason that I'm doing the course um, is that I wanted to make a social contribution. Um, I've been using GNU slash Linux for about the last 10 years, and lots of things suck. Graphics card drivers suck. Wireless card drivers suck. Text editors suck. And fonts suck. And I was thinking about this. You know, the reason that these things suck is because there are obstacles. Generally, when there are no obstacles, then things can be quite good. I'm not going to list any things which are good, but there are some good things out there which are free software, which we have our own favourites. So, what hard hardware companies have secret specifications, which means free software companies can't write drivers for those pieces of hardware. And there are also various laws which cause obstacles for people who want to write free software. Um, radio spectrum laws, uh, super copyright laws like the DMCA, the European Union Copyright Directive, uh, software idea patents in the USA. Um, and for fonts, there aren't really any obstructions, it's just that no one is actually working on this really. I mean, there are a few people working on it, but there's not that many. So I thought that I could kind of take ownership of this problem and so, kind of solve this and maybe I could get rich in the process. So the problem is this, there are about 20,000 typefaces on myfonts.com, which is one of the largest places, the largest distributors of proprietary fonts. And there are around 50 on Debian today. So that's kind of, you know, gives you some of the idea of the scale here. Some of those proprietary fonts take about one day for someone to do. You know, they're very simple, little fun things that anyone can cook up pretty much. Some of them take like one year of work. The course that I'm doing is one year full-time study and in that time, the students produce one typeface. What that means is a regular weight or like a boldness, uh, a bold, bold, and an italic, which is actually a completely new set of shapes. So the italic you have to redraw from scratch, basically. And the bold you also have to pretty much redraw from scratch. But you can do interpolation where you take the bold and the normal and you kind of mathematically interpolate the variations that there can be between that. So there you can you know you can start to get some gains in the process once it's good once it's done, but it takes a long time to actually get a typeface that's good for text reading up to speed. Making something you know very quickly for use in a poster is quite graphic. You know you can do that in a, in a day or two. Um, you know just one way, maybe just lowercase, just uppercase. You can do that quite quickly. But making a real typeface that you can actually use is a lot of work. And you know, for the really big typefaces, uh, where you have a lot of variations, you know, you cover a lot of languages. Uh, maybe you know, not only what you need for writing English, but what you need for writing all the European languages and Cyrillic and Greek and Polytonic Greek. And this starts to add up. These are a lot of letters which need making. Um, and so this is a large problem. So. To solve that, you know, there's, you know, when you're going to try and do something big, then you need to kind of model like a strategy how you're going to proceed. And uh, I was watching a movie Scarface the other day, and you know, Scarface says, first you get the guns, then you get the money, then you get the power, and then you get the women. So I was thinking about that. So to get free software fonts solved, then we need the tools, and then we need the knowledge about how to make typefaces as something that's free on the web, which anyone can learn and you know, watch and pick up. And then we need a business model to allow people to actually spend some time on this and uh, you know, earn a living doing it. And then we'll have the fonts. 
So what is a font? A font is a type design inf expressed or implemented in software. And so that sounds kind of strange to a lot of people, especially maybe some of you guys are programmers, I expect. You know, font, that doesn't sound like programming. So fonts are, in fact, programs. And this is a kind of technical distinction which I thought was quite interesting. You know, PostScript is a programming language. Um, you know, PDF is a kind of tokenized version of it, which isn't really a programming language per se. But PostScript is a programming language for drawing shapes. And it's kind of like logo. I mean, I studied in primary school. You know, you move forward, turn left. You know, you have a, these little programs for drawing shapes. And PostScript is kind of like that. PostScript is kind of simple, though. And so you can render a PostScript drawing program and change the data points or the kind of variables in the program interactively, and then you know have it save the program. And there are programming tools um, uh, where you can make the program visualized as a kind of flowchart and drag things around, and it will change the way the program works. Apparently, I mean it's proprietary stuff. I, my friend told me that it exists. So you know there there is similar tools available for actual real programs. Um, but obviously it works very well when the program is a drawing program to visualize it. So fonts have source code and the fact that you know, we didn't really think about them as programs doesn't really matter because the preferred form of the work for making modification to it is what source code is. So if you have um, a visual editor uh, and it saves the form file in a native file format then that's the font source and the fact that you never look at it like source code doesn't really matter. Um, the complete source code means all of the source code, including the scripts used to control compilation and installation. This is a definition from the GNU General Public License. And so a font wouldn't just be you know, the outlines, because those are already, those are, you know, by definition, they're going to be in the font file for you to use it. So the essential information is going to be in the, compiler, in the compiled final font. But the font source file will have some extra information, maybe like the guidelines, maybe you know some some things which get compiled into the font. And although there's a kind of one-to-one -one relation of the source file and what's in the font at the end, um, then you really want access to that original human preferred kind of form. So programs have legal restrictions. Uh, you know, software idea patents in the USA, uh, copyrights pretty much worldwide. And fonts also have legal restrictions. Um, fonts are typeface designs, and to explain the difference here, the typeface design is to the abstract idea for the set of shapes. The font is the implementation of that in software. And so the typeface design may be legally restricted in a different way to the font implementation of it. And there's also names. The name of a font can be legally restricted. So that can be done with trademark law, which is you know pretty straightforward, the same as the regular, I mean anything else. And typeface designs can be subject to design patents or design rights. And font software is software, so it's subject to copyright. So trademarks can last forever, and they can cover anything after three characters. They expire when you stop when a trademark holder stops defending them. So if you put a font out and then someone says, hey, oh, that's my font, it's called that, you've got to stop using that name, then you have to comply. But if nobody stops you, then you can carry on. And you can also um, use the first two characters the same. So if you have a font that's called Helvetica and you make your own free version, you can call it something beginning with HE. So it's going to be in the fonts list kind of roughly in the same place. But after three characters, then you can be liable for trademark infringement. And there have been court cases where proprietary font developers have you know, fought this out with real lawyers, and that's, that's the real case in, in the USA anyway. Um, and another interesting thing with trademark law is that you can't trademark any person's name. So if you can find a person with a name that your typeface is, then you can be sure that that is not going to be subject to trademark problems. Uh, you are standing above Oh, in front of the screen. Uh, when oh, right, the right. Is, when a line is very low, it's... Again. Nice point. Thank you. There's a... You can just stand uh, on that. Uh -huh. Thanks. Mm. Again. So type designs have a lot of different laws affecting them in lots of different terms. 
um, in the UK we have design rights, and design rights are given to you automatically like a copyright for 10 years. And design rights work kind of like a patent, in that if someone else independently comes up with something that's very similar to yours, then you can try and stop them. Um, the chance of you actually doing that is probably quite low though, because there are always going to be, if you do independently derive it, there are going to be small differences which are going to count. So you don't have to worry too much about this, but there that, that is something out there. Um, and it does mean that if you want to make a copy of someone else's design, then you have to wait uh, at least 10 years because of that automatic right. These rights can also be registered like a patent always, and then they last for 25 years. In the EU, we have a very similar thing across the EU, where you have an automatic term of three years, and then a registered term of five years, which can be renewed up to 25 years. And so, in the US, then, it's, it's pretty similar. Instead of design rights, they have design patents. So you have to register for them, it costs a little bit of money to register, obviously, and you get design patent um, restriction rights for 14 years. So type designs are not subject to copyright in the USA. In the UK, you also get a copyright as well as a design right, uh, but the design right is kind of a stronger kind of set of restrictions than copyright, uh, but you, you do have that automatic copyright for 25 years. In the US, um, you'd think that the US, you know, is being a very kind of country with a lot of laws about restricting people would have a long term of copyright, but actually have zero years of copyright fonts. And typeface designers, proprietary font others, you know, they get they get a big uh, issue fit about this. And what's wrong? I mean, this is their creative work. Why well, isn't there copyright? So Richard Stallman has these ideas, um, which he talks about in his copyright community speech, which he's been doing the last I don't know, 10 years or something, about how he sees that there are three categories of works based on their social uses, based on how people use them, how they contribute to society. The first kind of work is functional works, works of function, things that do things, so software, um, you know, encyclopedias, uh, recipes, things which you know, tell you how to do something and where you might want to change them so that it does what you want to do. Of course there are works of art where you appreciate them and you don't have that urgent need, it doesn't do anything, you just appreciate it, so you don't have that urgent need to change it. But of course, over time, then if you're producing art, then you want to reference and reuse other people's work. And then the third kind of work that Richard sees is works of statement and works of opinion where some party is writing something which says, this is what we think. And so it doesn't really ever make sense for people to be able to copy and modify those kinds of things, because it, it's better for society if you have to write your own opinion from scratch. If you take someone else's opinion and you know, move it around a little bit, then it's kind of misrepresenting them. Like people might mistake it for them, um, and, and so on. So those are those kind of three kind of works that we really outlines. And for artworks, then we typically have copyright, and you can't patent a piece of art. You can't patent a piece of music, and then try and see people who have music with a, who sounds kind of similar. The expressions of art are subject to copyright, and the ideas aren't. And so that's because you know if you could get monopoly over an idea, then that could cause all kinds of problems. And so in some domains then th those problems don't really occur because they're very tricky problem domains and it doesn't really affect anyone. And in software, you know, we have this problem where software has patents in the USA and so you can get a monopoly right over ideas in software and that causes all kinds of problems that I'm sure you're aware of. So you can get these kind of patents on type designs and that's, and in the USA you can't get copyright on and that's because typeface designs are functional. And what, I mean, people say, but it's visual, surely it's, it's artwork, but it's functional because you use it to read. You can see on the, top, on the first line there that, you know, this is, it's not very easy to read. It's very easy to make type not function very well. You know, the, the functional aspect of it is powerful. So we use type to read with 
functional works, Richard says, ought to be free. So type designs ought to be free. That's just the same way that software ought to be free. And the reason you know, that, that these things ought to be free is because they ought to be fixable. You ought to be able to fix them when they're broken and they don't do what we want them to do. And so typeface designs you know, also have problems. And this can be a little bit of a confusing statement. I mean, if, you can, if typeface exists and you can read with it, how's it broken? I mean, maybe you could make some small modifications. But there is a real big problem with, with all typeface designs, that they eternally suffer. And that is the error of omission. So a typeface design, if it's you know, developed for, for English, is going to be missing all of the extra characters that you need for other European languages, and maybe languages that are kind of similar. I mentioned, you know, like Cyrillic in Russia or Greek. You know. And if you have a text which has some Polish in it, and it doesn't have the Polish characters, then you have a problem, which is the error of omission. Um, Wikipedia is also, you know, I think is interesting because it also touches on this issue. You've got Encyclopedia, and Encyclopedia is proprietary and not apart from the proprietors can modify it, and it's fixed at a certain size. And there are topics which it omits. But with a free encyclopedia like Wikipedia, then people can fix those omissions. And now Wikipedia has two million pages. Um, they do actually limit they have a thing where if it's not notorious or enough or it's not used enough, they actually cut it out. Uh -huh. So so it still suffers from emission size problems. Yeah, if I had a big enough server. But if, if, if your page, if you think you've contributed a valuable page and it gets taken down, then I, mean, I imagine there are processes in the Wikipedia project where you can rewrite it, make it better, you know, try and prove your case. I mean, there are pages which are deleted as spam because they're about companies, and the Wikipedians are like, this company is a fly by night operation, it's not significant. Now, you, you have to have pages for significant companies because they're about history, but you know, my company isn't going to be on Wikipedia. It's ridiculous, it's me. You know. So, I mean, there's a, that's a social process in Wikipedia there, I think. The, Not the unless point. you make this happen. Sorry? Not unless you make this happen and uh, get these free funds and make money from it. Oh, well, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll be notable one day. So, um, so, software, you have software idea patents, and software is also subject to copyright. Type design in the USA and everywhere, as far as I know, apart from the UK and Germany, um, is not subject to copyright, but you know, these design rights, these design patents. And so, font software, you know, you might think is not subject to copyright, but in fact, software, font, fonts are subject to copyright because they're software. So, you have a literary copyright on fonts, which is life of the author plus 70 years in the UK. Like a program. So, fonts, typefaces implemented in software. It could be the same typeface implemented in metal or in wood or potato. When you print with it, it's going to look the same. How are typefaces implemented? Well, you draw them with pencil and paper. It's pretty straightforward. You just get on with it. And fonts are implemented with software. So, here are some examples of some free software that you can use to implement fonts. Inkscape's one, and um, I've got a little video from some guys in Argentina demonstrating Inkscape being used with a new kind of spline format called Spiro Spines, which are uh, brand new. It's come out of a PhD, of a PhD in mathematics at the University of California, Berkeley, and the software is released under the GPL. So the uh, splines, which you'll see in a moment, some straight lines, so they convert these to curves, which are regular Bezier curves. And you can see it's a little bit kind of wonky, the curves aren't very smooth. They apply the spiro spline effect, and it makes them very smooth. This is only available in GPL software, um, so that's very exciting. And the, the smoothness is in, kind of enforced mathematically, so you can't make a bumpy curve. If you're like a programmer and you're not very good at drawing, this is good stuff. So uh, yeah, you don't want just a little spindly thing like that. You want like a, you know a nice big shape. And so there's another feature in Inkscape in these path effects where you can add a freehand shape 
and throw it along uh, the spline. So you can see here that you have this shape on the top, this rectangle. As you edit that shape, it's you know transformed along the path, which we drew. It's nice and smooth, and you create you know a nice big letter form like that. And you can do some fun stuff where you can edit that shape, and you know it will be put along the path. So you can start to get some, some interesting variation, some sophistication into these shapes. Um, you can't do this with proprietary software. This is quite exciting. So yeah, then make the letter shape. You can see why typeface doesn't take some time. So yeah, so there's a kind of core typeface design type thing. And then you know that could be pushed into the illustration. Uh, that's what they do at the moment. There we go. So that's Inkscape. You can get Inkscape on there. And the stable version doesn't have those features at the moment. So you have to build it from source code at the moment. And then the stable version with those features will be out towards the end of the year. And they have Windows installers, Mac OS 10 versions. Um, you know, this is kind of a widely available piece of free software. And it's worth getting into. It's not a font editor though, you can't produce a font that you can start, you know, you can load into your system and using a word processor. To do that you need a font editor program. And we do have a free font editor program called FontForge, which you can download from SourceForge. And it looks kind of like this. It's not very pretty. So the reason for that is that FontForge is a kind of work of art as a program. It's made essentially by one guy who uh, is Pretty good programmer. He worked at uh, I think it's Green Hills, which was a compiler developer before GCC destroyed all the compiler developers. And um, he got rich in dot com boom, AOL stock options, retired, very nice. Uh, thought he'd become a primatologist, moved to Madagascar, didn't like the leeches. So he moved home, that's, that's California, you know, what was he going to do with his, with his free time? And his dad was into typography, type design, type stuff. And he wanted him to write the last chapter of his book on digital typography. And so he helped his dad out with that. And in the process, realized that there was no free font editor. And it would be fun to write a font editor. So he wrote one for the last 10 years. Because he's rich, then he's not making a living out of it. He's just doing it for fun. And because he's retired and you know has a lot of free time, if you go on a mailing list and you go, Here's a bug, here's a crash. He comes back within like within days with a fix. Like it's unreal. Like you can't get that good support from come from proprietary software companies. Like it's, it's unbelievable this guy. It's absolutely insane. Um, and so the reason that Font Forge is a work of art is because he's done it completely himself. So to go into the technical details of it here, he wrote his own X Windows toolkit because back in the late 90s when he started. They didn't, so none of the free software ones supported Unicode, which is a way of describing characters for any of the world's languages, pretty much. So he wrote his own toolkit to design, to, to create his own graphical user interface for his own font editor. And so that means that it works very well, but it hasn't been kept up to date, so it doesn't look as nice as free software toolkits, the other toolkits do today, like UT and UTK. And that's kind of ironic, because the font editor has old school bitmap fonts in its user interface. It's kind of a bit ironic there. But it works very well. It's a very capable editor, especially at the technical level. And he was a compiler engineer. So the font files that it produces are like bug free. So when you make a font with FontForge, it works. And that's quite exciting. 
So Cronford is also indicated Spiro, and so here is like a regular kind of Bezier curve N, and you can see you've got your own curve points here and the handles. And drawing with Bezier's is quite tricky. You have to spend quite a lot of time learning the ins and outs of it because when you move these handles, then the curve changes and it doesn't say smooth. Whereas Spiro's, you know, they mathematically enforce smoothness, and that means that you get you know e nice shapes easy. And it also simplifies things a bit. I mean, there are a few more points here, but spiral splines have only on-curve points. So it's very, it's very direct, like what you see is what you get. FontForge has also added Python scripting. So you can use all of FontForge's features from a Python program. And that means that you could write a font editor, and you could get all of you can get access to all of the technical, hardcore font engineering stuff that George has been working on for the last 10 years. He's also, as part of that effort to make it Python scriptable, turned the, the core functionality into a large C library. So if you're using a more complicated programming language, you can just call this C library and get access to all those features. So making a nice, modern-looking font editor is now pretty straightforward. And uh, there's a, a guy in Portugal who's been doing some interesting research, just finished a master's in kind of new media design, and his program is called Letter Soup. And Letter Soup is a kind of interesting program. It's based on some ideas in Metafont, which is the old typeface design program in tech system. And so it's kind of parameterized, so you can tweak these parameters to get different type shapes. And this is quite unusual. There aren't many systems that can do this kind of stuff. And it's very prototypical at the moment, uh, but he's, he's working on it pretty much full time at the moment. So it's going to be interesting to see where this goes. And you can export it. The, the font that you make there to, tr to a true type font format by using FontForge's Python scripting. This is a this is all in Python. This lets you stuff. And the uh, LetSoup program is based on Shoebot, which is another program which this student has done. And the idea of Shoebot is that it's a pure Python kind of re reimplementation of this program called NoBox which itself was an extension of a program called Drawbot. And Notebox and Drawbot were for Mac OS X only. Um, Notebox has actually recently got a uh, Qt interface, but just like the Mac OS X version, it very much depends on Qt. So you can't embed it in another program. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of monolithic. Whereas Shoebot is pure Python, so it's quite reusable. So this is, uh, these are interesting little programs because what they allow you to do is write simple drawing programs in Python and have the output you know, go and run in a, in a simple way. Um, so that's Nobox, which is still, which is also quite prototypical compared to my OS 10 version. And this is Shubot doing the same thing. So you can see that you know this has got quite far in terms of re-implementing notebooks. Like it's you know there's a one-to-one -one match here, and because it's in Python, it's not amazingly fast, but it's pretty fast. You know it, it can run can run pretty quickly. And because it's pure Python, you can stick it on the server, and you can make your web server call it to generate random images. And so you could have this as a random background image, which is you know, different all the time. Um, this is quite exciting, I think. So that's Let's Soup and Shoebot. And you can download that from tinkhouse.net slash shoebot. Another project I want to point out is the Open Font Library which is openfontlibrary.org. 
There are 95 free software fonts there, and it's a site which hasn't, it's been going a few years, there haven't really been any updates, no new features, it doesn't look that great at the moment, but we're working on that. Uh, I think by the end of the year, then the site will be quite a lot different and a lot more you know, interesting. Um, I think that this is a key thing that we need people to be using free fonts and telling the people developing them what the problems are and you know, knowing about the free software that's out there to make fonts and contributing. And by having a central repository where people can upload fonts, you know, to, to show them off, to get people using them, and uh, a place where people will go to download fonts, uh, that's going to raise awareness about all this stuff because, you know, it's, it's a lot of it's very typical, it's in development. Now, type designers, I'm studying with a lot of proprietary type designers, they say, real nice day, <coughs> cut the crap. How are you going to get rich? How am I going to get rich? You know, free? This is going to pay my lunch. So, step one, you need to find someone who wants a font, and you need to tell them you have a great deal for them. You can do, you can make them this new font for two thirds off the normal price, and you don't tell them the cash unless they ask. Step two, or step three, in fact, is to find someone else who wants the same thing and you tell them you've got a great deal for them as well. So, type design occurs, and you make some money. So that, that's a very kind of simple business case. I mean, I haven't, I haven't tested this out yet, but back in the early days of free software, uh, back in the 1980s, then Richard Stallman wrote GCC version one by himself, locked in a room for like a year, and it could compile C programs. And then Michael Tyman, came along, he saw this and he was like, this is a pretty good compiler, but it doesn't compile C++. I wonder if I can extend it to compile C++ as well. And back then, compilers were very expensive, you know, like tens of thousands of, of uh, American dollars per C licensing. Um, there weren't that many C++ compilers, there was still like a new language back then. And so Time was able to produce GCC off of uh, G... Uh, he was able to produce a C++ compiler off of the C compiler in a couple of months. It should have taken a couple of years to write a program like that. He did it very quickly. And so he figured that there was a business model, this business model. And this is, I mean, the way I've explained it is just for two people, to keep it simple. But if you can find a hundred people who want the same thing, and you can charge them 5% of the total cost, you'll make a lot of money, and they'll get a very cheap deal. So that's how you can get rich with free software. You have to find a lot of people who want the same thing and will share the cost of development. And because of copyleft, then you know, they're guaranteed that the benefits every one of them pays for is going to be shared by every other. Obviously, you can do private you know, modifications and people can pay the full cost up front and you can sell the exclusivity of that modification. But if you can find several people who want the same thing and they don't mind if other people have it, then that could be quite lucrative. So how can you get the free fonts that you want if you're not a type designer? You need to estimate the cost of the initial development, uh, which we can say is an A amount, and then you estimate the number of people who, who want what you want and are going to be willing to pay for it. And when I say people here, I mean parties. I mean, these could be organisations, companies, you know, graphic design agencies, graphic design colleges. I mean, there are lots of people out there who want fonts, who want to be able to do things with them. The proprietary restrictions don't allow. We'll call that number of people B. If you divide A by B, you'll have C. And if you times B by, say, an extra half, you'll have D number of people and C number of amount per people. You can set up a pledge bank, which is a website you guys may have heard of, where you can say, I will pay C amount if D other people do. If you publicise that pledge bank to the people that you know, you've estimated and, and you can collect their money, then you can pay a type designer to do the work. This applies to fonts, it applies to I mean, pretty much anything that you might want to do in a free culture context. And uh, the tech user group in the USA have created a free font fund, which you can donate to. So uh, if you have a font project uh, or, you know, something related to do with free software fonts, 
and you think, wow, if only we could have some money to pay someone to get this happening. If you can raise the money, you can tell people to send it to Tug, which is like a good, you know, it's a charity in the USA, it's a responsible organization, they have accountants, they're not going to scam anyone. And Tug design can occur. So what else can you do to help? You can join your GNU slash Linux distribution team and package existing free fonts which aren't packaged for your distribution so other people can install them easier. And you can email me about making a new font editor that looks nice. And you can have some fun making fonts because the tools are there and the knowledge isn't really there yet, but you can teach yourself. And maybe you can get rich that way. Questions? Uh, I think we're going to change the tape. No, it's all right. That's it. How long are you going to get donations? Because many companies actually like to buy rather than donate because tax-wise it makes more sense. So the uh, Tech User Group of America is tax exempt. It's a 503 c one yeah. A company in Italy wouldn't be able to use that. Okay. Because they can't write off, because in the USA, charity, charitable donations are tax deductible. So, you know, if yeah. you earn this much money, you have this much tax, you can pay the tax. In Italy, if I'm selling a design mm -hmm. something to someone, yeah. and I need to acquire a fund, I need to build, I mean, put that in the, down in the books as a, an expense. Uh -huh. So, well, I sold them this for 100, but I bought that for 10, so please only tax 90 of me. Yeah. Which means, it, and I guess in the UK you've got something similar, so you... Yeah. I wonder if you thought about a way to to make people buy, like, so I, I, to make that work, yeah. but with many people buying things. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it can definitely work. I mean, uh, I mean, I have, I have a company, so I can maybe do that myself. I mean, the reason that the, the tech user group is something I recommend is because uh, you know that's it's a, it's a charitable foundation with a board, they have accountants, it's very you know, transparent about what's happening there. Um, if you are in Italy and you pay money to an American charity for services rendered, I mean, maybe you put that in your books in the same way. Uh, <laughs> You'd have to ask your accountant, I expect. I'm not a lawyer. I, if I want to get shot by my accountant, I can ask that. Yeah. But, but, I mean, yeah, it's, it's something in which um, I think that there are going to be free software fund companies. No, because, I mean, since you want to make a business model using a pledge bank kind of system, then I really started wondering if your average accountant in the UK would actually... That, the, yeah, the pledge bank example is if you're a user and you want to create something. If you're a developer, then you're going to go to people and approach them and you say, you're going to go to newspapers and I say, say newspapers and design colleges. And you say, I'm a business, and I want you to pay me to do something for you that you want done, even though you don't know that you want it done yet, because you're not coming for me, you know, if you wanted it done. If you knew you wanted it already, you'd come with me. Yeah, and so, so there are going to be businesses, I think, going to do this. I mean, I'm personally going to be doing it, and I'm going to encourage other people to do this as well. Um, you know, there are a few dozen typeface designers who sing up to 10 grand a year in attending these master's programs. So there are people who want to return on that educational investment. And maybe they can do that by you know, dividing people and saying, you can't share these things, and you have to come back to me if you want anything changed. But I mean, these are just young people, I mean, like all of us here, you know, they share music and films and stuff as well, probably. And uh, you know, I think they're going to be interested in doing things in a different way. So maybe there'll be some Italy, maybe I'll come to Italy and uh, cause some trouble there. Would you say it's difficult to, as a sort of hobby, to get into typeface design? Like no, I think most people get into it. Uh, over the last hundred years, most people have gone into typeface design by wanting to. Uh, there haven't been educational places to learn. I mean, this is a very recent development in the last ten years. Uh, one of the tutors on my program is this guy called Gerard Unger, who is a famous typeface designer, he's quite an old guy now, and he's been doing type design for all his whole life. Um, and he's worked, you know, with metal, with phototypes, <coughs> you know, 
digital typing is seen at all. And I asked him, like, why did you get into typeface design? And he said he was, he was uh, walking down the street and he saw um, lettering for sale in the shop window. I can do that, he said. So that's why he decided that he was going to make a living that way. He was like, yeah, I can draw letters for a living. Why not? Um, and he made it. I mean, you know, he's in this like famous type designer, and his font is in newspapers all over the world. Uh, no one taught him anything. He just got on with it and managed to win an apprentice, like you know, get into an apprenticeship kind of thing, get some company, and yeah, he just have to do it. So uh, I work in academia, and as you know, that academics and produce lots of papers. Mm -hmm. and every time when we write papers and submit our manuscript. We are usually asked them to standardize our our type um, the code. For example, most of the I bet most of the academic just know about types in Roman and Arial. Mm -hmm. Because that's usually what I do for writing papers. Mm -hmm. And so I use the uh, Linux as well and so I usually use like a liberation steric and kind of a new folds and could use a compatible with um, Microsoft and yeah. other mm -hmm. mm -hmm. However, my colleagues will tell me that all oh, the phones we use is very strange and because you will change the title of the phones and when they edit the same document. Yeah. And so in fact it's the same phone, but like, they, they are just not realize it. So there are lots of um, um, the kind of um, anxiety over the kind yeah. of free software phones. Mm -hmm. So from the SPS perspective perspective, I mean, how, how would you convince my colleagues? Okay, okay. There's, there's the, the problem with trademarks over names means that if I make a font and call it Arial, then I'm going to be facing a lawsuit for monotype fonto because it's trademarked and, you know, it's not, that's not a public name that anyone can use. Um, so there, there's a problem which is not going to be solved ever in that. Um, you can change your own name into Ariel. But you can, you can, <laughs> you can have a phone and you can change your name into Ariel and then things will work for you. That's right. Um, but to do that, you still have a problem. And that if you have any old font that you rename an Ariel and you typeset your document and it's a full page and then you send it to someone and they load it, their computer is going to use their Ariel to typeset the page. And suddenly it will be two pages. And it will the layout be different. So you need a font which is metric, metrics compatible, which means all the letters are the same widths, like numerically, even though the shapes are different. And Red Hat paid for fonts. They paid a big proprietary software, well, it's not big, it's like a dozen people. They paid a famous proprietary font development company called Sender to create some fonts which called the Red Hat Liberation font geometrically compatible with time of your own and narrow. So you can use the liberation fonts and the documents will look the same and the font name will be different but if they change it to what they expect it won't rejig the document, it will stay the same. At least the yeah, but when people get panicked just because the, the name of the fonts yeah. change and so I just wonder how would you educate them in, in sort of an easy way and just tell them it's on the pen it's actually the same thing. Because yes, it kind of resistance from the mm -hmm. of of the kind of um, free software phones. That's it? right. Well I mean it, the first thing is maybe they're using like a proprietary office suite mm -hmm. and not free office suite on our operating system. So the first thing I would say is you know is that they install the free office suite and try and look at the document in that. And, you know, maybe there'll be less compatibility problems that way. There still might be compatibility problems, but at least you know then they're, they're trying. That, that's one practical way to reduce things. The other thing that I would say is you know that they ought to be doing that anyway because there's a social problem with proprietary software, and each person has you know some responsibility about solving these social problems. I mean, like pollution or anything else, you, know, you have a social responsibility to try and not you know to recycle. You know, be a good citizen. The part of being a good citizen is using free software. And people often don't realise you know, that there even is this issue of software freedom. And so patiently, happily talking about that issue, you know, might convince people to 
put up with the problems, basically. I mean, and if they move towards free software, then they'll have less problems. And this, is a, this is a transitional problem. Yeah. If everyone was using Vinny Slash and Opus free software, then we wouldn't have a problem. So that's really like the long, long, long term solution. Yeah. And moving moving in that direction happens by explaining people why they're in the problem. Um, and it's a long it's a long flight. <laughs> yeah. You'll be surprised to know that ninety I would say ninety five percent of academics are using Microsoft Windows. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, sure. I mean so. I mean most people are, yeah, yeah. But um, it's going down. Yeah, slowly. So yeah, I mean it's yeah. um, on, you talk about um, ways of um, paying for home development and obviously the um, approaching different companies and getting a group of companies to pay for stuff works and it's being done with software but you talk about a pledge based model with you know multiple users putting money towards mm -hmm. the ground has that been done already with bonds or software because it's, it's just hard to you know get a big enough number of n normal people together to do that Maybe. I mean, um, when I'm talking about individuals, then I'm really talking about parties. I mean, you know, a university is a person, it's a legal person. I mean, I don't know if you've heard about this, you know, it's kind of a funny thing in the law where companies are treated as people in the law. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have like, um, like just punishment for companies. Uh, we seem to have, uh, you know, kind of Strange things happening at the moment with governments, you know, bailing out big companies that fail, and you know, keeping them on life support when they should be like to die. Um, and like when companies are very bad, they then generally get killed off. Um, uh, yeah, that shouldn't really happen for people, but for the legal persons, you know, a bit of a Richard Stallman joke. But, um, so. I think that individuals, you know, typically individual people's contributions aren't in terms of aggregating money, it's in terms of them putting effort into doing things. Um, you know, a lot of people think that free software is all written by hobbyists, like university students in their spare time. And that's kind of funny because there are a lot of people writing free software for fun in their spare time because they're studying and it's a really good way of learning best practices. A lot of proprietary software that's sold, you know, not to the public, but sold to other businesses. It's really bad quality because it doesn't need to be good quality. Like if, if you're a restaurant and you need restaurant management software, then where are you going to go? There are, you know, a few dozen restaurant software companies, and that's it. You know, pick one, and probably you'll pick the one that's near you that can offer you support. So if it breaks, they can drive over like that day and help you out. So. You know, there are these other values that people choose software on. And so a lot of proprietary software is really bad. And free software, because it's public, it typically when it's public, it has to be good quality. I mean, if you're going to put your name on it and it's rubbish, it's bad. You want to put out good stuff and get a good reputation. So there's that kind of social pressure to write good stuff so people learn it you know, for those reasons. Um, and that's kind of long tail. Like, there's a lot of people doing lots of little things and then there's a head of the tail where there's a lot of software generated on a commercial basis, a lot of free software. You know, Red Hat, I think, makes like $400 million a year in revenue and $60 million profit. I mean, that's like, it's a lot of money and that pays for a lot of software developers. Um, and, uh, you know, there's that, there's that kind of thing. So I think for individuals, then their big, their big contribution is just doing stuff themselves rather than coming together. And there are big institutions which do have lots of money. Uh, I mean, this is kind of a funny thing, like for me, you know, when I've like, started working, um, a few thousand pounds for a couple of weeks worth of work sounds like a lot of money to me. But when I'm working with corporations, I'm like, yeah, it's this much. And they're like, yeah, pay it. You know, it's, people's attitudes to money is different when it's a corporate checkbook and not your money. And so um, there's lots of money floating around in the economy, I and mean, you know, the credit crunch and stuff. Maybe things aren't looking very good. Uh, 
uh, overall, maybe say in the building trade, and maybe got some problems. But there's a lot of money floating around for things, and um, yeah, I think you, you could be surprised if you went around to design colleges and said, your students want fonts that they want to modify and play around with and learn. You know, the proprietary fonts, you can't really learn how they're put together. You just get this thing at the end, and it's better than a lot of software. You know, it's, you can really you know, tweak fonts and move them around and stuff. You can kind of learn about them. But if it's not free software, if you don't have the corresponding source code, if you don't have all of the corresponding source code, you can't really learn how things are put together. So there's, there's a demand from big institutions with lots of money for stuff which they can you know, really get into and look around. And so, uh, yeah, I think the pledge bank thing is, you know, you can approach institutions instead of people. I think that's it. How exactly do you license free fonts? Okay, uh, that's a good question. How long have we got? <laughs> uh, five minutes. All right. Okay, free software font licensing. I intentionally left that out of my talk because it's a nasty topic. Um, it's, it's, a currently, there's, it's currently a problem. Um, in that there's a range of licensing options which people may want to do and only some of them are like proven, known, good, like tested. Um, so the, currently the font license that I would recommend in like as a first call is the open font license which has been written by SIL uh, which originally stood for Summers Institute of Linguistics and I think it just is SIL now. And that is a uh, Christian organization which promotes literacy in uh, you know, the poorest countries so that people can read the Bible. But promoting literacy, I mean, I'm an atheist. I don't really agree with that. I mean, you know, they can get on with it, but I mean, I, I, I'm a Christian. But I think promoting literacy is awesome. And it's amazing they're doing that work. And uh, to do that work, they need free software because what they're doing simply isn't supported by proprietary software. So they've done some very interesting technical work. And about the last, I think over, for over a decade, they've employed a very good professional typeface designer. Um, it's an American guy who lives in Britain. He's actually one of the professors on my course. He's got a book there, Victor Goldman. Very nice guy, you know, very smart guy. And so he has his college project, he was a student on my course a few years prior developed this font called Gentium, uh, which I recommend, it's a pretty fun. Right So this is a very nice typeface. The italic, I think, is especially nice. And this is released under the Open Font License, which is a license that he wrote to deal with a couple of problems as he saw it with the font licensing spectrum. So on the one hand, you have the public domain. So uh, I think Creative Commons is developing something called Creative Commons Zero. Because in the USA, you can dedicate things to the public domain, but in most other jurisdictions, you actually can't do that legally. You can, you can say it, but it isn't like a legally valid thing. So Creative Commons is working on this thing, CC0, I uh, think maybe you know, out next year, where you can say, I, I receive all rights to this. You don't even have to attribute me. You can just do whatever you want with it, and it's fine. At the other end, you pretty much have the general public license version 3 which is a copyleft license, uh, probably don't have to sync the choir here. Um, 
And uh, in between, then you have you know, weak copy left and non-copy left attribution styles. And for type designers, then a big, a big thing is attribution and also renaming derivatives. If Victor, I mean, Victor's made this font, and if I start making modifications, and I call it Gentium as well, then he's going to be kind of pissed off, because it's kind of misrepresenting his work. And there are also technical problems, as we kind of mentioned. I mean, you know, if you start installing lots of fonts with the same name, then you might run into confusion yourself, and you know, the problems can be technical. So the open font license requires derivatives to be renamed, and it also requires that you not sell the font on its own. If you sell the font alongside another, another program, then that's permitted, but you can't sell the font on its own. And so that's kind of curious, like in free software, we're very you know, pro allowing commercial activity. Um, and so you know, there's this question, is this really a free software license? But because you can write a Hello World program and distribute it, the font with that, it's, it's free software license. What's the reason for that? Yeah. What's the reason for that? Don't say it's not um, So the reason is that if if Victor, I mean Victor put this Jensen font out there. What he didn't want was people putting it on a thousand CDs for five pounds, kind of things, because it's like low quality, and he didn't want to be associated with freeware font people. Okay. Which in the typeface design community, you know, are very badly regarded because they're pirates or something. And um, typeface design proprietary typeface designers, you know, coming from this proprietary culture where they don't want people profiting if they don't get a cut. I mean that's basically what it comes down to. So they're like, yeah, you know, if, if, if a kiosk company wants to use my font, which I've made free software, so it can be downloaded by users at no charge, and the kiosk company wants to ship it in their product, then that's okay. But if myfonts.com puts it on their website and tries to charge people $10 per download, then where's my cut of that? You know, I've put this out there for no charge, it should be available at no charge. So that's kind of where you know the 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 reason that people prefer this license. And this is quite a popular license. I mean, I mean that's basically all the terms. So it's copyleft in terms of if you get a font under the open font license, you can do whatever you want with it. And when you redistribute it, what you redistribute is font software has to be under the open font license as well. It doesn't require a source code. And it, I mean, to me, that's like a. I mean, I would use the open font license personally because because if someone makes a derived version of my font and then just puts out like a subset of what they've done and there's no sources, then you know how can I integrate what they've done with what I'm doing? You know, that doesn't seem like a very good idea to me. But it's convenient if you just let people do whatever they want. I mean, that's you know, with that that's good and. The specific situation is font subsetting for PDF files. So if you have a PDF and you want to include the font in the PDF, and say that font is just under the plain general public license, then the GPL says you know that the combined work has to be under the GPL. So now that that PDF in total has to be under the GPL. So all the images and the text in the PDF will also have to be under the GPL. Yeah, although there's also GPL with inclusion exceptions, like yeah. the code generated by Python and Yak. Exactly, exactly. So, so there is the free software foundation in the GPL pack has this thing, the font exception, where you say, we make an exception, we give you additional permission to distribute the font software um, in a document, embedded in the document, um, uh, and without having you know the other things fall under copyleft, but all the other terms of the GPL you know, are there. And, um, this is this is you know complicated. I mean, exactly like the best practices for using the GPL. Victor said it's going to be a lot easier, and I'm going to get what I want if I write if I write my own license. And this embedding thing, I mean, you know, strong copyleft and stuff. There are these various problems renaming. 
there is a real need for a new font license here, a new, for a new free software license for fonts. And the Open Source Initiative, Free Software Foundation, Debian, Fedora, and these are all approved this license as free software and said this is probably a good idea to have a license that's by a typeface designer who wants to contribute to the free software movement and you know, accounts for their concerns. Um, because I'm coming from the free software movement then I want my stuff to be you know, GPL and I'm going to have to deal with exactly what the best practices are. Um, I mean, something that Victor didn't deal with, which I think you know, is, is interesting, I mean, no one's dealt with, is his design right stuff. I mean, in the UK, Victor has a design right for 10 years over his stuff, which he hasn't made any public notice of. Uh, so you could start turning around to people saying, ha-ha, you've got to pay, or, you know, whatever. So there are these interesting problems which haven't been resolved. Um, but if a font is available under a free license, then and some of them, you know, turned bad and they tried to you know, catch people out. I think they have a problem in court. Yeah. Well, presumably you can't enforce design rights that by the moment you've already published it with license attacks saying do whatever you want. I don't know. I mean, who knows? Who knows? I mean, I'm not a lawyer. None of this has been in court because it's so, you know, crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's, there is interesting errors. Um, Open font license, if you make a form, I recommend putting it under that.